Welcome to Guernica Edition's Poets 5 à 7 interview series, a collaborative project of Canadian poets and independent presses. Guernica Editions is based in Hamilton, situated upon the traditional and unceded territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. Today, multi-genre authors Nicola Volpe and Mark Frutkin will be discussing how they move between writing prose and writing poetry, and they'll also be reading from their forthcoming books. Nicola Volpe considers poetry an unfortunate habit, but has nonetheless published four collections of poetry, When the Mongols Return, Blue Tile, Insult to the Brain, which won the 2020 Fred Cogswell Award, and Through the Wasp Mouth I Drew You, a novella, The Extraordinary Event of Pia H., an anthology of Canadian poetry about the Spanish Civil War, and essays on subjects as, di as diverse as the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Afterlife of Norman Bethune. Mark Frutkin has published 17 books of fiction, poetry, and nonfiction. His most recent novel, The Rising Tide with Porcupine's Quill, published 2018, is set in Venice in 1769. His recent collection of poetry, Hermit Thrush with Quattro, was shortlisted for the Ottawa Book Award. His novel, Fabrizio's Return with Knopf, Canada, won the Trillium Award and the Sunburst Prize, and was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Prize with Canada and the Caribbean region. A French translation of Fabrizio's Return was published by Alto Editions of Quebec City in 2017 under the title Le Saint Patron des Merveilles. His novel, Atmosphère Apollinaire, was a finalist for the Governor General's Award for Fiction. His next novel, The Artist and the Assassin on the Life of Caravaggio, will be published by Porcupine's Quill in summer 2021. He has taught creative writing at Carleton University and University of Ottawa. He has received numerous grants from the Canada Council and the Ontario Arts Council and the City of Ottawa. His works have been translated and published in French, Spanish, Russian, Dutch, Polish, Turkish, Hindi, and Korean. His most recent book, Where Angels Come to Earth, An Evocation of the Italian Piazza by Long Bridge, Montreal, is a work of lyrical text and photography with Toronto photographer Vincenzo Pietro Paolo. Visit his website at www.markfruitkin.com. Welcome, Nicola and Mark. So, Mark. Yes. Another novel about Italy. So why Italy and why Caravaggio? Well, I've always had a great interest in Italy ever since I attended my third year of university uh, at a, a campus in Rome and uh, spent uh, all my vacations traveling around Italy and kind of fell in love with the, uh, the people, the, the, the landscape, the food, the wine, of course. And, um, and so I've always had uh, this interest in Italy. And I've had, um, I've published, oh, probably about five or six novels set in Italy. And I've made many, many trips back there to do research and to travel and enjoy the place. Um, why Caravaggio? Well, um, I've seen a number of Caravaggio paintings over the years, um, both in Italy and at the, the Metropolitan Museum in New York City. And then there was a big exhibit of Caravaggio paintings um, and other paintings of that period at the National Gallery in Ottawa some years ago. And that really um, interested me. And so um, I started looking into Caravaggio and um, I had seen, um, you know, a few um, television programs about him and his, his life started to interest me. And so um, as the more I looked into it, the more I got interested in the fact that um, this fellow was not only a fantastic 
wonderful painter, but a bit of a scoundrel, <laughs> um, a character, um, a person who, um, oh, he, he would use, um, he would do things like um, use a local Roman prostitute um, as the model for the Virgin Mary in one of his paintings. And while he tried to keep this quiet, this became known. And um, so he got in trouble with the, with the Vatican. And, um, but he had his, his protectors there too, high level cardinals who were willing to help protect him. And, um, and so I was very interested in his life. And then the thing that really struck me was the fact that he invented the um, artistic form called chiaroscuro, the technique called chiaroscuro, which is- Chiaroscuro, clear and dark. Yeah, yeah. using uh, dark surroundings to bring out the light in a stronger way. Like a, like a beam of sunlight penetrating the forest and lighting up a patch of leaves. And I thought, this is a very interesting metaphor for his, his life. On the one hand, he had this brilliant creativity in his painting. On the other hand, he had this dark side. And I think each one uh, um, le lent more power to the other. What was the inspiration for your collection through the wasp mouth I drew you words and phrases drop into my head from I don't know where um, things continue I um, and, and I really I really don't know I know that different things as I was working on it things kept dropping in from everywhere from you know lives of poets I mean I mentioned Osip Mandelstam in there but there there are others and there are other events and uh, I go off somewhere and there's Camus de l'Etranger is in there as well and the drag in a few philosophers, but drag in all kinds of things. I have no idea where it comes from. I just so know why it arrived and I followed it and uh, that one just keep, kept going until it didn't. Why the title? Where does the title come from? Why wasp mouth? If you think of a wasp, there's this very narrow, narrow Part. And so it seems like if you're drawing something through a wasp that mouth, it's um, it's uh, it's difficult to get through. I had a a, a friend just right, right yesterday saying that he thought that this image reminded him of or made him think of drawing some someone uh, dear to you, close to you. Um, through that, and I think that's as good an explanation as any. Lots of novels, lots of poems. You move between the two, and I know you've got them. You know, you you you've got several going at the same time. I know you've got an, at least one novel going now, and I know you've you're writing poems at the same time, and I think some essays and so on. And I don't know, are you writing with right hand, left hand, one of your feet, or how do you how do you manage this juggling act? Is it are they all aspects of the same thing? Are they? completely different things is one flying the other run running or swimming or but how do you how do you do this they're both connected and not connected i easily move between the two it's not like i have to finish a work of fiction before i can write a poem um, or finish a series of poems before i can write a work of fiction i think the ultimately the for me personally um, the difference between fiction and poetry is um, where the source of inspiration. With fiction, um, for me, the source of inspiration is almost always just an overarching story. Uh, quite often with my novels, I know the beginning and I know the end, but I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get from one to the, to the other like Kafka's uh, trial where he wrote the, the beginning and the end and then filled in all the rest. Also the fact that um, a lot of my novels have, a, have a, a biographical aspect to them. Not all of them, but uh, at least four of them 
um, for example, my first novel, The Growing Dawn, was based loosely on the life of Guglielmo Marconi, the inventor of the wireless radio. And then uh, Atmospheres of Polinaire was based on the life of French poet Guillaume Apollinaire. And then The Lion of Venice was based on the life and travels of Marco Polo. And my new novel, The Artist and the Assassin, is based loosely on the life of Caravaggio, the Italian artist from the 1600s. So I, I have a structure to work with there with, with the novel. Now, in terms of the inspiration involved, um, it's that knowing, you know, having that structure, knowing the beginning and the ending with a poem, the inspiration always comes as a line. It just comes as a first line and then a next line and a next line and a next line. I never really get the poem as a whole, although the first line might suggest a direction or a series of lines of similar similar content. So, but so you, you, it's always a first line, never a middle line or yeah, it's almost I, I think I almost always start with the first line. And do you keep that line or do you throw it away sometimes? I think I usually keep it. I right. tend to throw away last lines. Uh -huh. <laughs> Other than that, there's really no difference. And writing for me is writing. I mean, I write poetry, novels, nonfiction, and essays. Um, and I can write any one at any time, all on the same day. I'm very envious of, of that ability. You too have written prose fiction in the form of several novellas. How do you envision and approach poetry versus fiction? I think that they are completely different things. They're not all aspects of the same thing at all. They happen to be using language that we read and speak and, and listen to and, and so on. But for, for me, they're, they're, they're completely different things. They're, 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 as, they're similar in the way that constructing a, a house and constructing and building a chair or building a house and assembling and putting together a chair are similar that they're building things or the way that painting and sculpture are considered visual arts. I would put uh, fiction more along the lines of um, something like painting or a frieze, or even though fiction isn't necessarily linear and, and poetry more like sculpture, carving something out of whatever happens to be there by removing all the rubbish that shouldn't be there, mostly. Mm. Uh, throwing some more rubbish on and then removing lots more <laughs> and working my way through that. I've written essays and articles and things like that. And that's just a completely different thing. And with both fiction and, and poetry, I don't know if I already know where I'm going with it. I think it's, it's already, it's, it's already a failure. I can't uh, mm -hmm. allow it to, because then I'm thinking it through and not allowing it to take over, if you will, so that I follow it. Of course, you have to think it through. And then afterwards, there's the editing where you really have to think it and say, this is, you know, this theory doesn't work. But while I'm trying to get somewhere, I have to allow it. If I already know, oh, I want the poem to say this and be this way, then I think I've already killed it. Well, ultimately, they're different for me, too, in the sense that, you know, they're different forms. Are you actually agreeing with me? Um, I, I think I could do that. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll mark that on the calendar. Then. I'll read a bit from, well, this is the book. And Dylan asked us to hold it up to show people so that when it's in all the, uh, the, the um, bookstore uh, front windows, people will recognize it and say, oh, that's the book and we have to bring it, uh, bring it in. And it's from the uh, latest uh, book. And I really, I'm certainly thankful to Guernica for taking a chance on uh, publishing this, uh, but um, as they do publishing any poetry, I think is taking quite a chance. I'm reading from a bit towards the end. It's a, it's a long poem in 99 parts, and I'm reading from part um, 96 through to 98. So there's just reading three parts, and then uh, there's, a, but I'm not gonna read to the end of the thing. No comet streaks across the indigo. 
no planet arc, no star curve, comet. Of course, no comet. Silent parrot on her perch, she stretches her wing and shifts, opens her beak. Or so did she once. What use this word I found at last? Thrumming silence, childhood's dust, grimy window, rain. Switch flick into night weight, air sink. This, I suppose, is the end. Though again, under its trowel full of dirt, the worm will be wanting his lunch and the seed will push pale tendrils to the sun. At day's blind end, I time dredged and tallied, the sloop arrived rag tonnage, sans tret, sans cloth. At the zero summed arrow stop, the barman's whistle, the demirage paid, subtle weight null. We walked until our feet bled, we walked until the fences tore our rags. We walked until the truncheon men fell on us, we walked until the sun set and the sun rose. We walked until we remembered only how once our feet bled, how once we had rags, how our bones were broken until we remembered only how once the sun set and the sun rose. Thus we are free, say the saints, thus the conclusion lizards into us all. Boatman, boatman, here is your coin. Ink will not be affixed to air or wind. Where are we now so far from our homes? What journey, no compass, no map, alone. And the star we knew like a sister has hidden itself amongst all the others. That's it, thank you. Lovely, thanks. Now, oh, Mark, it's your turn. Please read for us. Okay, I'm going to read uh, from the opening of The Artist and the Assassin, uh, my new book, uh, my new novel coming out with uh, Porcupine's Quill. And the, uh, the book is based on the life of Caravaggio. It goes back and forth with uh, sections on the assassin and sections called the artist. And I'm going to open with the section of the assassin. The assassin, Luca Passarelli. I am the cloud in the sky and you artist, the cloud shadow scurrying over the earth. I am the cloud over your shoulder, sailing through the heavens, encountering no resistance. I carry lightly the thoughts, the belief of a man who has never known doubt, while you, Michelangelo Marisi da Caravaggio, are the shadow of the cloud on the earth, rolling up and down hills as you try to escape. Where cloud and cloud shadow meet will be your end. Rome, 1600. He has me posing as a saint, me, Luca Passarelli with a thief for a father and my mother a wet nurse. To be precise, he wants me playing Saint Matthew. Matthew, the one called by Christ from the streets to his spiritual life as an apostle. I sit at a table in the vaulted cellar of a palazzo belonging to one Cardinal Del Monte. I'm waiting with the artist's other models, several older louts and two young men, boys really, snappily dressed in silks, wealthy punks out slumming with the likes of us. The artist chooses to pose me as the apostle and saint. If you can imagine that, me, a saint, I would qualify for a saint's vow of poverty, certainly, but not by choice. Me with my one set of worn, flea-ridden clothing, a shirt, a tunic, a pair of hose with holes in the knees, I cannot afford anything else. He has made me to look older than I am, and I am no Jew, though Matthew was. Altogether, seven of us pose in this cellar. Two of the models stand across the room, representing Jesus and Peter. Christ himself is pointing at me. The rest of us sit around the table, counting the coins I gathered, as if we are preparing for a night of gambling. I am the focus, me, Matthew, known as Levi the tax collector in the ancient stories. The light shines on me and on the young scamp to my left, one of the artist's favorites, I hear. 
I wonder if he is betting the boy. Could be. I wouldn't be surprised, but I can't say for sure. Michelangelo Medici, this artist from a little village called Caravaggio, stands across the room gazing into his enormous canvas and working it, licking his brush before stabbing it again into his palette and occasionally glancing out at us models post around the table. His eyes are sharp, he bites his lip, he wears his thick black hair longish in the front, youthful style. A small window of this cellar is covered by a sheet of paper soaked in olive oil. I watched him early the first morning pour the oil over the sheet in a large pan. I could smell it, expensive stuff, enough oil for a family of six for a month. The old guy sitting to my right complained on the second afternoon. Why not make a quick drawing and let us out of here? Finish the painting in your studio. Marisi didn't even look up from his palette when he replied in a flat voice, I don't draw. He offered no more than that. Not I cannot draw, but I don't draw. No explanation, no apology, nothing as if we were invisible, as if we were made of clay and he the creator. What kind of artist is he then? I'm no expert, but it seems to me an artist should at least have a skill to draw. We sit here day after day as he vanishes into that other room in his huge canvas. It must be more than 10 feet across, coming out once in a while to look at us as if, as if we are statues, models, actors, our lives disappearing, dissolving into thin air, vanishing into his great work. We are less, we are worth less than drying pigment. Stop moving, he warns when one of the boys adjusts his seat. As long as he keeps paying me, I will sit here and put up with it, but I don't have to like it. Your poetry collections appear to each address a single theme or subject. For one example, Insult to the Brain, your previous collection, is based on the many ways in which famous poets have met their death. Do you tend to decide on a theme first and then write to that theme, as opposed to writing individual poems that you then gather into a collection? Thanks for bringing up Insult to the Brain. It's also published by Guernica, and there it is. I did write a poem recently complaining about how editors want to have themes in, in poetry books and that they tend to like having being able to say well this poetry book is about this <clears throat> and then and um, it makes for making blurbs a little bit easier and all that anyway the, I, we already talked about uh, wasp mouth and how I just some bits started dropping in and I just followed it and it was and it is one poem uh, and different things and kind of tends to keep wanting to go off in different directions. And I think I had to bring it back in to keep it as one poem. Uh, Insult to the Brain was, uh, I'd written a couple of poems, a few poems about, it's about how poets in the, over the last hundred years had, had about their deaths. And I'd written a few poems and I was, um, I was, I'd started, it took me 12 years to write that one and it started more than 12 years, actually more like 15, but 12 years where that was the, the project. Um, so if you imagine that works out to about one page a month, considering the length of the book. So you wonder why poets don't make a lot of money. Um, anyway, and what happened, I'd started a, a, a job that I knew was going to be quite um, demanding. I mean, job just as they are, but it was going to be time intensive and demanding. And I said, I need to do something that um, I can just get back to in bits. I can't take on a, a novel, for instance, or something like that. Not that I'm very good at taking those on. And I just started writing a few more poems about the same thing and then just kept going and it just went along. And actually since then i haven't quite got rid of it because since the book was published i have actually written a few more poems that if i could go back and cram them into the book i would want to but that's okay mm -hmm. that's maybe for for next time or whatever so um no i tend to write all over the place and i it's 
sometimes they they come together and sometimes it's very hard for me anyway to see how different poems I've written over a certain number of years would actually make sense in the same collection other than I'm the guilty party. I want to ask you about the different shifting points of view. You just read, it was Luke, I believe, is that correct? Yes. So, and, and, but in The Artist and the Assassin, you have um, different points of view from the, <coughs> written in the first person and the third person, and from different people. So why did you do this? Why did you not just pick one and, and go with it? And, and I, I know you well enough and you work well enough to know it's that, oh, I can just do this conjuring trick. But what, what, what do you think it helped you do in, in, in the novel? The, the assassin portions are written from the first person point of view and the artist sections about Caravaggio himself are written from the third person point of view. I've specifically wanted to do that because I've read books that go back and forth like that. And I've read some that are all in third person or all in first person. And I always found a bit of confusion. While I'm in the midst of uh, a section, I'm wondering, oh, oh, wait a minute, who is this? And I wanted to be very, I wanted the reader to be able to be very, very clear about where he is and who he's reading about. Um, so if he's in per, first person, if he's reading something in the, in the first person, he knows he's reading about the assassin. If he's reading something in the third person, he knows he's reading or she knows she's reading about the artist. And so I wanted to be very, very clear um, that's something that bothers me about many novels that I read is the, the, the complication of um, point of view and character and um, number of characters um, and, and that kind of thing. And I, I like, um, I think clarity for me is really important in fiction. Taking the opposite pole from Virginia Woolf, for instance, with Mrs. Dalloway, where you never know whose head you're inside. I, I have a few um, COVID poems that, that I'm, I'm going to read this. I've been working actually on a series of poems, wacky poems for weird times. And so I'm going to read a selection of those. I've been putting a number of them up on Facebook. And, I'm, and a lot of them are somewhat humorous, it's maybe helping people lighten up their feelings during the pandemic a little bit. So the first one is called Caves. Are we not bears hibernating, sleeping through the season in our caves outfitted with Netflix and Zoom? Are we not bears staring in boredom near to death at the calendars on our walls, waiting for each page to melt away and bring back the images and air of spring? Are we not bears hibernating in lockdown? ready to don our unsmiling masks and head out into the forest, the world? Is it not time someone invented a way to send cookies and muffins by email? This next one is called Conversation with a Light Bulb. I had a conversation with a light bulb today, the one in the lamp that cranes its neck over my desk. It was daytime, so the light was off. I figured it would be listening instead of putting all its energy into producing light for my forays into wacky poems and paying bills. Light bulb, what do you want to be when you grow up? A fireman? A Buddha of some sort? A crazy poet with a large crack in his head where all the words fall in? Or a devil? known as Beelzebulb. The light bulb had no response, continued to ignore me. And that's when I realized it was asleep. And so was I. I turned it on and all became clear. And the final one, short one, is titled The Obsessive Poet. I have a code. So I write an ode, put on a bonnet and plaque out a sonnet, feeling rather dyspeptic, lean into the sea wind of an epic, 
So to entertain and please you, I tickle out a haiku. Then I have a dream and imagine an Alexandrine. Hey, you mustn't, you can't use a rhyme so slant. Could be worse, try another verse. Help, help me every time I have to pen a rhyme. Good, I'm, I'm not going to be so cheery. You know me, Mark. <laughs> That's okay. This is, this is a poem uh, that um, the Manhattan uh, Review has picked it up. I looked the other day and I realized that I actually wrote this thing in before February 23rd, 2020. So just as the little bit, we were just starting to find out that things were going wrong. Uh, I, was, I, I mentioned this to Maha, my, my wife, um, the other day. She said, no, Nicola, you're not that much of a genius. You did not predict the pandemic. <laughs> I <laughs> know I did not, but I must have sniffed something that this was not going looking good as the news was coming in. It's called On the News That Sagittarius A Grows Hungrier. A Sagittarius A is a celestial object out there that's just eating up everything around it, um, out there somewhere in the universe. On the News That Sagittarius A Grows Hungrier. It was in the second year it reached us. We live, after all, distantly. We were unprepared, of course. No one had troubled to inform us of its trajectory or of the simple measures known to defeat it. At the center, we learn, Ophiuchus had grown increasingly voracious. Unnoticed, we thought, perhaps we'd just manage. When the serpent consumed its children, it might also consume itself. Beyond any charted constellation, distant from even a junior satrap's court, in our shivering villages, perhaps we'd just manage. I am told the weather at the center is pleasant, constant and warm. They do not know ice. Here, on still days, birds drop from the sky. When it arrived, we took no notice. It's not that no one died, people always die. Children, we all wanted the red chairs, the red chairs framed in chrome, the chairs of fame and ambition. But they were never for us. We have no great cities from which we'll flee, tired of the light, tired of the noise, no long black beaches where under parasols, sick, silk wrapped courtiers stroll. Our streets are usually muddy, our technology and fashions rudimentary, as are also our manners and emotions. We express ourselves stumblingly. Our languages, after all, are devoid of abstractions. An idea is equal to a stone, a legal codicil, a post, an argument, a stream bed, or a comet trail, an ejaculation. And love, well, love when we hazard it, an awkward but permanent exchange of shoes and bedsheets. We ornament our poems with pseudoscience, caged quarks and the like spinning or barking. No one's troubled to complain. What import, after all, muddled science and muddled poems in an insignificant language in a barren land where locks are unknown because there's nothing to steal? And anyway, so distant as to be beyond returning. All communication with us is into the past. What microbe or virus could assail such rueful life? Yes, we wanted the red chairs, the chairs with chrome frames, the red chairs of fame and ambition. All we got was rumors. From the center, we surmised from those cities we'd seen in pictures, cities of satin and alabaster and red lacquer. From the center where the serpent ate and ate and ate and grew hungrier. Rumors of warehouses, ships of medicines, vaccines, not destined for wind-tortured villages beyond the lazy reaches even of old light. And the waiting, the waiting, the horizonless wait. We send you our condolences for your losses. We've posted our lists inside of what here may do for public buildings. We believe them complete, though approximate, the last census, school registrations, birth notices. If anyone should pass and the paper holds, at least we'll still have our names. Thank you. I wanted to ask about scoundrels. As you mentioned earlier on when you were we were you were talking a bit about uh, the artist and the assassin and presenting it 
to us and talking about Caravaggio when I asked you about, you know, why Italy, why Caravaggio? Well, he's a scoundrel, but should, what do you think about understanding the art, the art and the context of the artist? Does it matter? Oh, I mean, for instance, Ezra Pound did a propaganda broadcast for fascist Italy and uh, Simon, the uh, Belgian uh, uh, crime writer and novelist of other things as well, mostly crime writer, creator of Maigret, uh, was by you know, many accounts a, a, a quite a, an unpleasant person. And yet they make art and we, we adore the art. And what, is there any connection for you? I mean, you, you've worked not just with Caravaggio, but with other artists. What do you make of this? In this time that we're in, where, um, you know, everything is up to question and measurement and consideration and, but I don't think we have to connect the art and the person. I mean, I can, I certainly dislike um, what, you know, what Pound was and what he stood for. But I find it had absolutely no effect on his poetry. His poetry is, is wonderful. Um, same thing with Maigret, you know, a wonderful writer, awful person, yeah. But there's not really that much connection between the two. Um, the thing that you produce, it's, it's, it's almost like saying, um, if, if someone is a really bad person and he has a child, should we um, not let that child live because that was from a bad person? No, we don't, we don't say that. The child is separate from that bad person. The child can have its own life. Well, the poem, the novel, the work of art, the painting, they can have their own life separate from the person who gave birth to it. Just, just with that, so once, once, the, the, once the work is, is, is out there, I, I did not say that it's not, it's, not in, it's not interesting or worthwhile to know about the person who created it, but you're saying we should, we should evaluate the work in, we should isolate it from the character of the person Yes, un, un, unless unless the work is involved in some kind of justification for the person's bad acts, in in which case maybe the work should be, you know, refused or tossed aside. But if the work really has no connection with the person's bad acts, um, then I think it's you know it's their child an independent being. And we've kind of addressed this a little bit earlier, but talk about the title of Through the Wasp Mouth I Drew You and whether it is one long poem or a series of separate but linked poems. Well, I'll, I'll, the, the title, that's one of those things that, that um, just you know, dropped into my head. And um, just back to that poem you read about the poets with the big, uh, Crack in the head, crack when the words head, fall in, words falling in, and so on. Exactly, uh, <laughs> but from that, and yes, I I do think of it as as one one poem. There were little bits that that I had written at some point as separate bits of poems, and then I thought when I was working on this that they they fit, they worked with uh, with the, the the longer poem and and should belong in it in it. So speaking of children, they were adopted by the by the, by the poem <laughs> so, um, so yeah that that's 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 about all and 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 it's there yeah there are bits of it that you could you could extract and say okay this works as a, as a poem by itself but i i think i would like it to be read i would like it to be read as one one continuous piece because there is a connection between the end and the beginning and no i didn't write the beginning and then the end and then filled in the middle no i didn't didn't go that way I did move some things around, but I, I think there is there is a thread in there. There's even a narrative, if you want. Um, though I'm not, you know, sure exactly what what all the threads in the narrative are, but that's fine. I think there there is one there, and there's a movement from from one thing to another, and, and so on. And now that's I good. Uh, we go back to speaking of endings. You you. I don't want to give the 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 ending of the artist and the assassin away. Do we know how Caravaggio died? 
And, and I think, but that's, let, let me please just continue with the real question, which is how, whether we know about how Caravaggio died and doesn't, or, or if we don't, there's the part uh, about the, your novel and does it matter? Is it, how, how concerned are you about historical accuracy? I mean, in, in, in Fabrizio Return, we, we which um, got the, um, the Trillium Award, if I remember correctly, you, the, the, now this was not about a historical person as far as I know, though there were some historical uh, context and set in Italy as well and so on, but does it, does it matter? Could you have made up a Caravaggio if one hadn't existed? And, but since one existed, do you care if you are historically accurate with, for instance, the timeline of his life, um, details that we know or don't know about his life, or do you just pick and choose the ones you want, throw out the other ones, and, and go with that? Okay, let me talk first about uh, the basic question of how Caravaggio died, because that was actually one of the inspirations for writing the book. Um, the fact that there's always been a lot of mystery ab around Caravaggio's death. Now, I've, I've done some research, and there are people who will claim that um, they have um, Caravaggio's DNA um, from some bones in a town north of Rome, and that uh, contradicts other findings um, that say that he died as he journeyed from Naples back to Rome, which is south of Rome. How he got way north of Rome, I would have no idea. But um, there's always been a lot of mystery around his death. And so that kind of left an opening for me to start working with um, some aspect of the novel that I wanted to follow through. And I won't give away the ending, but um, it's very important to the ending of the book. So it's not all about clarity now. Well, if there's no clarity, <laughs> historically, you can't claim it. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm bringing <laughs> you on, I'm, I'm, I'm uh... Yeah. And as far as um, historical accuracy, I do like to be fairly accurate historically, but within every historical story, there's plenty of room to investigate the more intimate worlds of a person's life. You may read a biography of Caravaggio that is very thorough, but it doesn't give you their day-to-day -day life and what they were thinking and what they were going through and, you know, their emotions and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, and so even though a, a lot of my books are historically based, like Fabrizio's Return was, um, the historical aspects are, are pretty accurate. I do a lot of research to make sure that, you know, I'm not having motor cars in 1600 Italy. <laughs> I don't really, I didn't really have to research that, but uh, um, I like to keep the historical aspects accurate. But within that, a person's life has this intimacy and richness to it that is not in history. It's not in the historical record. And that provides a great amount of room for play and invention and fiction. And so that's, um, that's where I like to go and, and invent things. So that's basically uh, my answer. All right, so-, so was, that, you... was that evasive? Well, I think it was, I, know, I think it was quite clear. I, I just- uh... <laughs> I, I'm, I'm always impressed by the research that I, I know goes into your, uh, your, your novels. And I know how sometimes yeah. you ask me about things that you said, oh, well, Nicola, would you happen to know about this detail or that detail or something like that? And very, very careful about that. So yes, yeah. you're, not, 
you're not having them you know wear wear silk before there was silk in that country and things like that yeah. things that we just kind of goes back in the blurry mists of time yeah thank you no that 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 helps through the wasp mouth i drew you almost seems to be attempting to reinvent language why is the collection so fascinated with or even obsessed with the use of invented compound words, many of which are quite intriguing. Now, people might not have heard them, but a lot of the words, comp, you know, linked nouns that you were reading are really written on the page as compound words, which I found just fascinating. Well, like, you mean like piston sneezes? Like what? Piston sneezes. Yes. That's yeah. So, uh, well, the, the bit about sticking words together sometimes on the page is because it does make a difference in how it's read. If you see piston sneezes, you will read it and you will understand it differently than piston sneezes. Mm -hmm. And when we, when we read, we, I think, I, I don't think I'm going off into, into silliness. Uh, what I believe, what I've un, been led to understand about reading is that we do not read um, each letter of a word uh, except when we're learning to read. And if you've ever learned to read a, a new alphabet, for instance, I know I found myself looking at every letter and it's very slow to read that way. And then you read every letter and you figure out the word. And then with a language where you know the alphabet, but you don't know the language and then you, okay, you work it through. But when we read a language we're familiar with in an alphabet we're familiar with, it all, uh, we just sort of see the shape of the word, the context, and we know when we move on. And so we can be quite quick and scan things that way. And I believe there have been experiments done with switching letters around and people still getting the words. And if you notice in manuscripts, proofreading manuscripts, missing the same typo, letters transposed and so on, especially if they're the same size and similar shape over and over and over again, and until somebody finally uh, so I think that by sticking words together, I make people stumble over them a little bit, not just out of plain orneriness, but to try to um, make the reader, the listener, see it um, or understand it a bit. Stop, stop, and and, and up with try to understand it a bit better. Yeah, I slows them down. It slows them down, and the. The, the other thing about it, and I don't, I, I, I'm not at all, I actually like clarity in, in, in poetry. I don't mm -hmm. want it to be all muddled just for the sake of it. However, I also want, I use it as a device. And I think poetry always should be, is always doing this, even when it's the, the, the simplest, more straightforward, we're familiar words, very clear, it disorients us. It should disorient us so that we come to something in a different way, understand it a little, little bit better. Yeah. And with wasp mouth, and I didn't know it when I was doing it. I did not realize that just that this, I wanted this, it sounds right. I want to do it this way. And then um, I think that what I tried to do is present something so that when we, we stumble over it, and I, if you've ever um, listened to a conversation, and I know this has happened to me many, many times, conversations with languages that I'm just, a language I'm just trying to learn or learning in, in, imperfectly or, or just been exposed to. And sometimes there'll be a conversation, things going on, and I will have understood it. Now, sometimes I'll get it really wrong, but sometimes I've understood it, but I could not tell you a single word as a specific word that was in uh, that was in that conversation, but from secondary clues, if it's in person, from um, familiarity, and it can be with languages that are very different. It's not just a question of cognates, like if you know Spanish and you hear Italian, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I've, as, as you know, I've, I've had to learn some some Arabic, and and you know, mm -hmm. Arabic everything works differently from from. <laughs> from in, in Indo-European language, as far as I can sure. know. Just sure. when you think it's gonna go one way, it goes the other way. And yet after a while, 
in a conversation, in a context, we start coming to a language so different. I think that we start understanding things and I could never tell you exactly the whole detail. And I think through the wasp mouth, I'm trying to do something like that so that we, we, we are disoriented, uh, you know, and maybe I exaggerate a bit, but disorient sufficiently that we kind of like, what just happened here? There seems to be going on. I think also, I, you know, with the sounds and all that, try to make it engaging so that we don't just, oh yeah, I don't get this and, and toss it away. So that it seems engaging, what am I getting here? And then you go, okay, what just happened? And then after that, you decide what you want to do with it. You know, throw it away or go back to it or... So we're, we're disoriented in order to become reoriented. Sure, yeah, yeah. So I think that's what's going on there. I'm, I'm not just, I mean, there's fun with it too. And, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to, there are places also where I don't do that. It's not all that, I give you some relief. And I think I even try to, you know, be a little bit silly sometimes and, and, and uh, <laughs> I'll bring in some, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, silly little, you know, jokes or, or whatever, things going in that. And yeah, so to disorient you, give you some relief and then afterwards say, okay, well, what happens then? Right, and you maybe come to it a different way and think yeah. about it a little way. So that's, I mean, it, that's it, all I can, yeah, you can see it. You can even see it in the in the title of the book through the wasp mouth. I mean, wasp mouth is you have it down as a compound word, and if if you had it as two separate words through the wasp mouth, I drew you. It would have a different feel, for sure. Um, it would it would be like oh yeah okay every wasp has a mouth but when it's joined together it it's like it becomes its own thing in a sense through the wasp mouth yeah, i think so it has a different different quality it's very very interesting technique i, I really find it intriguing thank you for watching poets sank set with guernica editions stay tuned for a very special compilation recap Next week, we have 22 authors, and we're bringing you their very best Poets Sankasset moments. So tune in next week, and don't forget to like and subscribe.